the instructions of the word of God to us. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this place. Have your way. Speak through me the words that you would have us to hear, that it would go directly into our hearts, where it would bear fruit, change lives, help us to fulfill the purpose that you have for us. And so we give you the, the praise, the glory, and the honor for all these things in the mighty name of Jesus, the Lord our Christ. And so we thank you. Amen. 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 So our message for today is entitled Kings and Priests. God's intent for us is that we reign on the earth, that we have dominion. When God created the earth, he gave Adam, he spoke unto him dominion. He said, let them, meaning all of mankind that would come through Adam, have dominion on the earth. And he gave us rulership over everything, every living thing that's on the earth. We're the ones that are supposed to rule and dominate. Now, it's not God's intent that we dominate other people, but that we actually have rulership so that we can fulfill the very purpose he has called us to. He also has raised us up as a nation of priests. By the way, I like the uh, example of behind me here, the picture of the chessboard. Years ago, I played chess, and um, I have to say that I was one that dominated on the chessboard within a year's time of learning how to play chess. I would have people drive from different cities to come and play me. This was before all the electronic games and everything else there. So I know something about uh, how to play chess. And I'd have to say all the natural lessons that I've learned in life, I've been able to transfer over to how they manifest and how they also function in the kingdom of God. Now, I've noticed something, that there is a deep, heartfelt desire and longing that people have for leadership. There's two areas in particular where I notice that there's a void that people have that they know needs to be filled, but quite often are disappointed in the choices that we have. The first of these is leadership in civil government. Now, we're in an election uh, season right now, and people have very strong opinions on the kind of leadership and what kind of government they desire. I've seen cycles where a leader, a leader will arise, capture the people's imaginations and loyalty, either because of impressive words or the speeches they're able to get. They get elected. Then after they're in office for a while, we'll notice certain character, um, um, uh, character defects that become apparent. And then after a while, people want to move on. And so in my lifetime, I've seen this swing back and forth between the two parties where there'll be a person rise up, electrify people, we usher him into government, and then after a while, get disappointed and then want to move on. And so the swing goes back and forth, back and forth. And many times, the person that's coming into power has the exact opposite idea, the exact opposite political opinion of the one that we so willingly ushered into power before. And so there's obviously this void, this need that each and every one of us has for uh, godly leadership, for rulership that is just. And this vacuum uh, for leadership that people uh, can trust in the long term and so it, uh, it causes people to quite often get frustrated. Not only get frustrated, but we then sometimes people even give up. And so th um, there are certain ideals that I know that we have deep in our heart um, for the uh, desires that mankind has for leadership that provides vision, the services, protection, as well as honesty that people desire from government leaders. There was a time when a nation had the perfect leader. God had promised Abraham that um, nations would come out of him. And God told him that there would be one nation in particular that would rise above all the other nations in the earth. But God warned him that this nation would first be enslaved for 400 years before they would rise to their potential. And as you can guess, that nation was Israel. 
God raised up a leader who connected with God so closely that he could hear from God. He could hear every single word that God spoke. And that leader was obedient to what God was saying. So God used, na uh, used Moses to deliver the nation of Israel out of slavery, out of a bondage, and eventually they settled in their own land. And for a few hundred years, this nation of Israel, um, they prospered, they thrived, they were able to de defeat all of their enemies, and they did all of this without a king. And the reason they did this is that God himself was their ruler, and the godly leadership that raised up all learned how to depend on God. And so as these leaders that God rose up, uh, they would go to directly to God for their counsel, for their decision-making. And so the nation of Israel, they thrived, prospered, and were able to defeat, like I say, all of their enemies, and yet they operated in peace and tranquility, even when they were greatly outnumbered. But after a while, Israel became dissatisfied with having God as their, as, as, as their leader. And so they desired the very type of rulership that all the other nations saw, and so they desired a king. We can see that uh, in the book of uh, Exodus, God already had spoken to Moses the, exactly the type of kingdom, the kind of nation that he desired to have. But obviously the people forgot that. In Exodus chapter 19 and 3, it says, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I, have done, what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So back in uh, verse, um, verse 4 of Exodus chapter 19, where it says, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings. God was saying that even when you were enslaved in Egypt and you had no power to come out, you saw all the plagues that come upon the Egyptians, yet none of those plagues touched you that were in the land of Goshen. And so God had a way of separating his people from those that were in Egypt, and even now in modern day, those that represent a type of Egypt, which is the world and the world system. Uh, these plagues came upon them to the point where at the very end, when the firstborn children of all the Egyptians, including Pharaoh himself, were killed, they finally said, get out of here, just go. But the Lord did not allow them to leave without provision because he had promised Abraham, that when they left, they would come out with great wealth. And so the people went and they asked all of their masters for their gold, their silver, which they willingly gave just to get rid of the people. God was telling that even when you were leaving Israel and Pharaoh changed his mind and he sent the army out after them to bring them back, God supernaturally protected them, and after they, ran, uh, they, they left, they were trying to escape, and there was nowhere else to go but the Red Sea. God supernaturally parted the waters so that all of them, over two to three million people, could walk across the sea on dry land. Even as the Egyptians were coming after them in chariots, God supernaturally protected them with clouds that shielded the people and with fire. And only after the last person had safely landed on the dry land on the other side that he allowed the waters to come back and the entire army of Pharaoh was killed. And so God was saying, look, you've seen what I have done for you. 
Many of us have witnessed, even in our own personal life, how God has miraculously provided. And sometimes, even with all the things that we can witness, that we've testified about, that we see other people testify of, we have all been guilty as Israel and wanting another king, wanting other leaders. Now, after God provided leadership for, like I say, over several hundred years that went from Moses all the way to Samuel, it was during the time when Samuel was a prophet over, over Israel that the people decided that they wanted to have a king to rule instead of just having the theocracy where God was in charge. And we can see in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4, it says this. It says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together, came to Samuel at Ramah, and said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, which went with which they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now, therefore, heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will rule over them. And so God told Samuel to warn them. And what Samuel warned them about was the very type of rulership that we're experiencing right now. He told them that the kings, when they ruled over them, they would take their sons and daughters, and when they desired war, they would have them go to war, that they would be taxed, and that they would have undue burdens put upon them. As a matter of fact, when uh, God told Samuel to warn them, he said that the kings would tax, uh, tax a tenth of your income. How many of us wish that our taxes was only 10%? So right now we see that the very words that God had spoken has come, uh, had, has come to pass. And so they began to complain about the type of uh, leaders and the type of rulers that they had. I've also noticed that there is another vacuum that people have, not just only in civil government, but even in their personal lives. In church, I notice that there's frequently people that will only come to church, they'll only come when their lives are in ruin. Thank you, Manny. As a matter of fact, I was one of those that I waited until my life was in shambles and then God miraculously delivered me from a crack cocaine addiction. And so I've noticed that people will think that they can do things just fine on their own without any need for God and only when their lives are in ruin, whether they're strung out on drugs, they get involved with various lusts, addiction that causes them to lose their jobs, relationships hit bottom, and then they come to God for help. Well, thank God that the church is here to receive the very people that come looking for them. And so it's our job to embrace them and to show and give an example of what godly leadership looks like and how to function um, as the type of priest that God wants us to function as. Now, it was always God's desire for us to operate and to function as kings and priests as we saw that. God desires that the leader that you're longing for be you. Each and every one of us, God has designed that he wants us to function as kings and as priests. When Moses was that man that led Israel, he became tired and weary because he was the one that was uh, bearing all the burdens. He was the one, um, the only one that could connect with God. Thank you so much.
For some reason, these lights just uh, operate almost like a sun on me here, so thank you here. And so um, Moses actually got tired, and he went to God, and he complained. And when he complained, we can see that in the book of Numbers, chapter 11 and 6. Um, Moses went to God, and God responded to his complaint. So in Numbers chapter 11, verse 16, it says, So the Lord said to Moses, Gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting, that you may stand there with you. Then I will come down and talk with you there. I will take of the spirit that is upon you, and I will put that same upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with you, that you may not bear it yourself alone. So what happened is that as uh, Moses was leading the people through Israel, just like the Lord said, they began to turn back on God to complain. After a while, they said, oh, we wish we were back in Egypt. Could you imagine wanting to go back into slavery? He said, they said, we had better food there than this manna that is tasteless. And so they began to complain. After a while, they started complaining that they had no meat. God supernaturally provided that uh, uh, almost a storm of quail would come down so that they would have flesh to eat. And each and every time they began to complain, it would just grate on Moses. So he went, he complained to God, is like, look, why do I have to be the one that directs this people, that hears all their complaints? So God answered by saying, the very same spirit that's on you, I'm going to put on other people. So he commanded them to select 70 men of good reputation that were honorable men. And he said, I'm going to take that same spirit that is on you, and I'm going to put it on them. Now, as it turned out, in Numbers 11 and 25, we can pick this up. It says, then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took of the spirit that was upon him and placed the same upon the 70 elders. And it happened when the spirit rested on them that they prophesied, although they never did so again. But two men had remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other was Medad, and the spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those listed, but who had not gone out to the tabernacle, yet they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. So Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, one of the choice men answered and said, Moses, my Lord, forbid them. Then Moses said to him, are you zealous for my sake? Oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets, and the Lord would put his spirit upon them. So it's the desire not only of God himself, but godly leadership, but they not be the only one in charge. It's the desire of our senior pastors, and our apostle Ron Danita, that others be raised up with exactly the same kind of anointing. One of the things that is their heart's desire that we as a church train up godly leadership so that they won't have to be the one to do these things. I know that God has called them. He's given them other assignments, but there's some things they can't do until the leadership rises up. And that leadership, the ones that need to operate as kings and kings, is each and every one of us that's here in the sanctuary and each of you that are watching this on live stream. And so that's been God's desire forever. As I was praying here earlier, I, I prayed and I said that the Lord Jesus, before he left, said that I will not leave you comfortless, but he sent the Holy Spirit. We know that the Holy Spirit came out and was poured out on the day of Pentecost. And with that pouring out of the Holy Spirit, each and every one of us that either that believes in the Lord Jesus Christ receive him, we have the Holy Spirit. And then God's desire is that the Holy Spirit just completely fill you so you can complete the work and the assignment that, that, that he needs you to do. So what does it mean to be a king and priest? Now, most of us function in life primarily as kings. And when I say primarily as kings, 
Kings understand their position of rulership, of dominion, and they go out to battle and bring back the spoils of war. So when I say they go out to battle, for most of us, our battleground is where we spend most of our time, and for most of us, it is on our jobs. And for a lot of us at our jobs, going to work can seem like a battle. I was one of those I mentioned that I only came to Christ once my life had hit bottom. I had gotten strung out on drugs. I was on crack. I had lost just about everything, and then God supernaturally delivered me from addiction. I immediately began to go to the church of the pastor whose house that I uh, received the Lord Jesus and was delivered in. And so as I began to go to church, um, God began to pour into me. I began to learn the word, and there was this hunger and thirst for the word of God that I had where every single day I would begin my morning by praising, by worshiping God, going to his word, and there I received the very instructions that I would need to live um, uh, or, or to meet the challenges of that day. See, one of the problems with people that are on drugs, even after they get delivered, they still have all the friends, all the relationships, all the people that they used to hang around, and many times those people get them to go back. God would supernaturally give me the exact words so when those people would come to me, trying to get me to participate, I could see that, those, that there were demonic forces operating those people, and God would say, no, George, they're just trying to get you to go back into slavery, to go back into Egypt. And so I would speak out things there that would just grab their attention. They were shocked that I wasn't the same person that I had been. Well, God supernaturally directed me to employment. I started working at a health food store, but there was an issue that I had that, first of all, prevented me from getting the very job that I knew that God had called me to. And that issue was, what do I do and what do I say when I go on a job interview? My previous job, I had lost that job because I had stolen, embezzled things from the company just to support my drug habit. And so I remember praying as I was going there, I says, Lord, what am I going to do when they ask me what happened at my other job? And the Lord said, well, just don't lie. So when he said, just don't lie, in my mind, I thought, all right, God's going to work it out so that the subject never even comes up. So I go, and sure enough, uh, there I am. I'm meeting with the person who's the manager of the store. And um, he had already known me uh, because he actually was a customer of the previous place that I had worked at. And he says, you know, George, I know you work well with people, but I just have to ask you, what happened at your other job? So where I thought that God would work it out so the subject would never come up, that was the first subject that came up. So I was just honest with him. I said, you know what? I ended up uh, getting addicted to crack cocaine. I started stealing things to support my habit. He says, was it a lot of stuff? I said, yes. He says, I mean, a whole lot? I says, yes. And he goes, well, what are you doing now? I mean, are you going through some kind of program, some kind of uh, NA or um, um, AA program? I said, no. I says, uh, God has miraculously delivered me. I actually shared with him my experience about receiving the Lord Jesus. I says, my AA and NA program is going to Bible study. It's going to church where I receive the word of God. And he says, well, you know what? And this person wasn't a Christian. He says, I'm actually tempted to believe you, but I'm going to have to tell the owner about this. I said, you know what? It's no problem. If you'd like, I'd be glad to, to uh, talk to him myself. So he said, well, give me a few days and then um, come back. So sure enough, I went back a couple days. And uh, he says, oh, you know, I really haven't had a chance to talk to him yet. I thought it was strange because um, he had gotten that position because all the other people had left, and I knew he was opening from op working from open to close. He needed help. So after I went, and he blew me off a couple times, he finally said, look, George, let me be honest with you. I did talk to the owner. We're very reluctant about having someone who's had that kind of an issue work in the store. We handle a lot of money, and everyone that we know who's had that problem they always end up relapsing. I said, you know what? Everybody I know that's been on crack relapses too, but I'm different. <laughs> he looked at me like, you know, almost like, who do you think you are? But anyway, after 
I, he said that, and I left home. I was a little bit disappointed because I knew God had supernaturally directed me to that place. And I remember I went to church the very next day, and one of the messages that the pastor of that church had, it came from the book of Malachi where the Lord said, bring all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me now herewith if I'll not open up the windows of heaven and pour out such blessing that you're not able to receive it. And I remember going home after that because from the very first day that I had gotten delivered and I began to go to church, and when the um, word would go out about tithes and offering, I would gladly bring my tithes, my offering. At the time, I was making so little money, people probably thought it was a tip, but that was the funds that I had. And so when I heard the word of God, I remember I went home, I says, Lord, you said that if I were to give, you're going to open up the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing I'm not able to receive. I said, I don't see this kind of blessing. And if uh, I know that you're God, but if this is true, you're going to have to show me. That's exactly what I said to God, because I believe in just being very real. I remember the very next morning, it was just shortly after 9 o'clock, and I got a call from the very health food store where the guy had blown me off. And he says, George, he says, I just got through talking to the owner, and he changed his mind. And he says, you know, if you feel good about hiring that guy, why don't you go ahead and uh, hire him? I, I, I think we should give him a chance. While he was talking to me um, on my call waiting, there was the owner of the place that I had gotten terminated from for stealing and embezzling. He called me up, offered me an opportunity to come back. I said, Lord, you obviously have to have a sense of humor. I'd have to have a clone to work both jobs. So by operating in integrity, God opens up, and I found that God is true to his promises, to his word. When he said, prove me now, he was saying, put me to the test. And I found that the word of God isn't just true because it's in the book. When God says, put me to the test, he wants us to test him. And that's what I did. I said, Lord, if this is true, you're going to have to show me. And God showed up big time. You see, God is no different now in the 21st century than he was with Moses and with all the other miracles that we see in the Bible. And so, first of all, I began functioning as a king. Within a, a year's time, I began working there. And after a year and a half, in fact, well, before that happened, I remember there came a time. Initially, I was working there Monday through Saturday. And then after a while, they made a decision that they were going to be open on Sundays. Since there was three of us that worked uh, there, we decided that they would, we would uh, um, alternate on the Sundays. So I remember because we opened up at 12, I would go to church, and I would go to church, praise and worship would be going on. And just like here at the Carpenter's House of Worship, the praise and worship team would just usher us into the presence of God. And on the Sundays that I would um, have to go to work because I had committed to do that, I'd be praising and worship, but then I'm looking at my watch knowing that I had to go and open up the store. And I remember one time in particular, the um, Spirit of God was just moving in the church, moving on the people, and I didn't want to go, but I knew I had made that commitment to uh, go and to work on Sundays. So I go to work, and it just so happened it was the slowest Sunday that I'd ever experienced. And God let me know that I needed to be in church the next day, or to be in church on Sunday. So I talked to the manager at the time. I said, you know what? Um, Sundays, or working on Sundays, is interfering with my time with God and going to church. He says, well, what are you saying? I mean, when we first started this, we all agreed that we would alternate. So are you saying that it's fair that um, just uh, me and the other person work all the Sundays? I said, well, if that's what we agreed to, then no, that wouldn't be fair. He goes, well, what are you saying? I says, well, if I'm supposed to be in church on Sunday and it's not fair that you guys work all the Sundays, then we should close. He says, oh, George, the owner would never go for that. And he cited all the statistics about how much we were bringing every Sunday. I said, uh, look, if you want to, I'd be willing to talk with him. And he said, you're serious about this? I says, yes. He says, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him. 
The very next day I come to work, George, I don't know what you have going, but beginning immediately, we're closed on Sundays. See, God has designed us to be both kings and priests. And so God used me, just a baby Christian at that time, but because I stood in what the God was telling me and what the Spirit of the Lord was speaking to me, God changed the policy of that place, and that's God's desire for each and every one of us. It's also God's desire that as we come to church, we don't remain a baby Christian. So when I came, I really was not a churchy person. I told you I had been out in the world and everything, and so I came to church because I knew that that's where the word of God was, and I knew that I could get instruction that I couldn't get on my own. So as they called for volunteers, I just did whatever. I began ushering. When they called for people who needed to clean the church, I showed up there to clean the church. Gradually, um, in fact, within less than a year, our, um, the pastor at that time asked me to teach. I said, me? What do I have to teach these people? They're the ones that helped to pray me into the kingdom of God. But I can tell you, I remember the very day that God had dropped this ability to teach into my spirit. Never went to school to learn how to teach or do anything. But in one day, I realized that God had given me this gift. And it was two weeks later that our pastor asked if I would teach our adult Bible study. And it, after uh, first, you know, thinking that he was nuts, and he says, no, George, I prayed about it, and I know what God said. So sure enough, I began teaching the class. Uh, people, the very people that I pointed out that had so much more knowledge and experience, immediately, like they would come afterwards, you know, I've been saved for years. I just never heard anyone bring it out like that. So I began to serve. Um, I operated our bookstore, other things. And so gradually, God began to elevate. So the first thing we have to recognize is that all of us come from a position where we have to start from somewhere. We come actually as, as, as babes in Christ. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and 13, it gives a scripture that many of us are familiar with. Whenever we see problems, whenever we see issues and we're wondering why doesn't this person or that person do something god has commanded that that the responsibility for changing situations first of all begins with us and so it says when i shut up heaven and there's no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people by the way pestilence is sickness and disease very much like the coronavirus Whenever we, receive, we see things where there's famine, where issues are going on that are beyond the norm, God is trying to get our attention. God is wanting us, he's giving us a warning that says, come back to me. And so he says, when I shut up the heaven and um, the locusts are there to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So God's desire is that first of all, repentance comes and it begins with each and every one of us. Our announcements announced that on this Friday evening, we all have an opportunity to come to the church and pray. And so there'll be some that will be staying overnight. There's something about, um, giving yourself to prayer, humbling yourself, recognizing that you don't have it all, and that we seek the face of God. To seek the face means that we're desiring God's goodness. We're desiring to turn. And he says, first of all, my people have to turn from their wicked ways. If each and every one of us examines our hearts, we'll discover that there are some issues that God is working um, that, that's wanting us to to, to leave, to turn away from, to go to the next level. And he says um, that as you seek my face, then will I hear from heaven, forgive the sin that is blocking the blessing, and then the Lord has promised that there will be healing. And so each and every one of us has to recognize that we have to take responsibility for ourselves. And so it first comes from this posture 
of humility or of humbling ourselves. In the book of Galatians, the Lord breaks it down like this because he mentions that when we're in training to become a king and priest, we all start from the same position. So it says, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so, when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born of, under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his sons into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. That term, Abba, is an endearing term like Daddy. God's desire is that we come to a relationship that we know him, that we hear him, very much like Moses had, where I said that he could hear very clearly from God. Moses had a spirit that was so in tune, and because he was like God, he was a perfect example for the people. If you notice that Solomon, Solomon was the one who was given an opportunity to reign over Israel after David uh, passed on. And so when the Bible says that when we're a child, we don't differ any more than a slave, Solomon, as he was going through the training, he, he wasn't free to do his own thing. He had to learn how to, um, how to rule, how to reign, how to direct the people, um, and exactly what to do, very much like if you see royalty. I remember when um, um, Prince Harry um, was younger and his older brother, and of course they were the ones under guardians and tu tutorship. They were the ones that had to serve in the Royal Air Force and other things like that. And whenever they got out of line, they always ended up getting correction because there's always a training that happens because you don't just learn how to rule and reign without, um, without any training. So when Solomon was in this position and finally uh, David passed on, Solomon knew that he was the one and Solomon um, dedicated the house of God. David, his father, had provided everything that was needed Solomon there, and Solomon sacrificed a sacrifice that has never been seen uh, before or since that time. And so with that sacrifice, God was very pleased. And so God came down to Solomon, and then uh, he asked Solomon, what is it that you desire? And so in 2 Chronicles 1, uh, beginning with verse 8, we see that take it up. It says, and Solomon said to God, you have shown great mercy to David, my father, have made me king in his place. Now, O Lord God, let your promise to David, my father, be established. For you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Now give me wisdom and knowledge that may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this great people of yours? Then God said to Solomon, because, you, because this was in your heart and you have not asked for riches or wealth or honor or the life of your enemies, nor have you asked long life, but have asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king, wisdom and knowledge are granted to you and I will give you riches and wealth and honor such as none of the kings have had who were before you, nor shall any after you have the like. So the very first step that we have to ask in the book of James, it says, as any of you desires wisdom, let him ask and God will liberally pour out on him. As you can see, Solomon asked for wisdom, knowledge, and God poured out liberally, making him the wisest person that ever lived. And what he did not ask for, the wealth, the riches, and honor, 
God poured that out on, on them also. You can read in the Bible and you can see how Solomon actually had kings that would bring all the wealth of their land actually for building not only uh, his palace, for the, the, the temple that he made, and for everything. And Solomon reigned and ruled when he had that humble heart the nation of Israel prospered above all nations. It was only when Solomon um, f turned away from what his mother and what the word of God had told him, began to follow after other women, that the nation of Israel declined, Solomon declined, and then eventually Israel was captured. But one of the things it says is that uh, because wisdom and knowledge are granted you, I'll not only give you that, but riches, wealth, and honor. Now, one of the things that we have to understand as a king, God's desire is that we all have abundant provision. That's the riches and wealth. And that abundant provisions means that we have to understand how to manage it, how to utilize it. Just like I mentioned that none of us that comes into the house of God knowing exactly what to do, but we all have to go through a process of training and so many of us that are here are already signed up for what I call on-the-job training. I noticed that many of us are already serving in the house of God. One of the things that the Bible talks about, especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, towards the end of those, it talks about different gifts. And not everybody has the same gift. But one of those gifts is the ministry of helps. One of the things that I've discovered, when you're trying to find your place, you're trying to find your position, just begin by helping wherever help is needed. There's almost always gonna be a call goes out, look, we need help volunteers, whether it's to take down chairs, set up chairs, whatever it is. I found that just by helping where help is needed, it's amazing how once we have a heart to help, God uses that to funnel us into the very area where he supernaturally gifted us because he's the one that already knows what the end is going to be. He told us that I had, I know, he said, look, the plans that I have you are plans of good and not of evil to give you a future and a hope or an expected end, which means that a future that is much better than your present. And so what happens is we enlisted the ministry of helps it's amazing how God then begins to supernaturally guide, lead us, and as other positions come up, it's amazing how it makes way for the new people that are coming in. And that's actually God's plan, that uh, as new people come in, they go to work, they go to help, and all of us then begin to learn how to function as kings and as priests. Not only did God mention that we were supposed to be kings and priests in the Old Testament, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and 9, God reiterates that because now we have the Spirit of God in us. And because we have the Spirit of God inside of us, God himself can supernaturally direct us. And he tells us that we are a chosen generation. Now that word chosen generation means that God pre-foreknew he selected us exactly for the time that we're on the earth right now. There's no accident that we were born right now. God has chosen us to be here right now because he knows that we're the ones that are equipped to do the work of what's needed. And even though we see ourselves in hard times and things that are going on that seemingly has never happened before, God has chosen you for right now. He's also made us a royal priesthood. Royalty is kings and queens. And we're that royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that we may proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so as God has supernaturally translated us out of that realm of darkness into his light, as we walk in the light, it's amazing how we can have fellowship one with the other. And then what happens is that God begins to cleanse us, and then God raises us up as the holy people that he always desires us to be. Amen? Amen. So I pray that you uh, were able to receive this message. I apologize for all the sweats that were going on. 
But um, I believe that this word, as you apply this, I'm actually watching, and it pleases me over the uh, years that I've been here, to watch new people come in, see how you all are being equipped, see how God is raising you up, and I see all kinds of leadership actually getting in position right now where um, people just came in, maybe sometimes lost, didn't really know where they are. And so it's so good to be a part of a house where uh, people can come, where we have godly leadership that's honest, that's transparent, that's ready to equip, and has a desire to help each and every one of us. So I thank you all for your diligence, for your faithfulness, not only to God, but your faithfulness to this house. Amen. So I know that this is also good ground to sow in. And so at this time, I would like for us to receive uh, our offering. For those of you that also want to give a tithe, if you have that, you can give it at this time. There are those in the sanctuary that are uh, preparing to be able to receive, uh, to receive it in person. You can also, for those of you that are um, watching, you can also text your giving to Child Church to 77. If you're on our Child Church website, which is childchurch.org, um, you will notice that there's a button at the top that says give, like at the opening page. If you click on that, all you have to do is just follow the instructions that you see for giving. You can also um, give by mail, and you notice that our post office box is there, and so you can give at post office box um, I'm sorry, but I'm having a little issue uh, seeing that here. But uh, you can see it online here, so <laughs> feel free if you want to mail your, your giving, you can give it that way. So while we're um, giving the offering, I would just like to share um, a scripture that frequently I use or that I actually um, go to when I'm preparing my own personal giving. God actually has in his word um, all kinds of word, all kinds of scriptures telling us that as we give, it will be given back to us in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, the Bible says, will God give into your bosom. Your bosom represents the storehouses, your bank account, your checking account. I've heard it said, and I found it true, we can never outgive God. God is the one that as we give, it will certainly be given back to us. There's another scripture, too, that the Lord um, uh, shares with us. It's in uh, um, the book of Isaiah 55. And he says, just as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and it doesn't return there before it waters the earth that it may bring forth and bud, so my word shall be that goes forth out of my mouth. It will not return to me void, but it shall accomplish the thing that I sent it to perform, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So one of the things that we have to recognize that when you receive income, the very first thing, the very thing that God wants us to first have is seed for sowing. And after that, the provisions that we need for living our lives. And I believe that if you follow that pattern and you follow that example, you'll always have to give and you'll always be able to receive in Jesus' name. So as we give, let's just, um, um, in prayer, Father God, we just love you so much. We thank you so much for your goodness and we thank you for the word. You said that your word that goes forth out of your mouth would not come back to you void but will accomplish the thing which you sent it to perform. So we thank you, Father, that here in this place and across the nation and everywhere where there are godly men and women of God, that you're raising up kings and priests. Those of us that understand our place and understand how to operate in dominion and rulership, we thank you that we're not just like secular kings, but we're also priests, and so as we live godly, holy, you use us to be able to affect not only the jobs, but all the people around us. Thank you for using us, even as we go into the grocery stores and at work, as we share the word of God and share the things that you have done inside of us. We thank you that the very word 
comes forth out of our mouth will go into the hearts of the people where it will bear fruit in their, um, in their lives that you will transmit met any, a many out of the kingdom of darkness into your mind and proclaim your praises in Jesus' name. Amen.